Who are you? I am still Jello Biafra. You don't even remember that by now? This is part three of this interview and you've forgotten my name more times than, I don't know, people like Nancy Pelosi or Dianne Feinstein forget where they are now. Thank you so much for part three. Part three. Thank you, Jella Biafra. And I want to begin part three of our interview with these simple words. Fighter. Fighter. And why do you want to begin it with that? Well, it's one of the wildest album covers I've ever seen in my life. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, it's because, you know, I think I know why too, but we were talking about, there were all these other obscure records, independent records, not just 50s, 60s or 1977 through the punk explosion onward. They were always there. It's just being able to keep up with them or find out about them just plain evaporated and stuff. But there were all these other records and we showed some of the bar band ones and things like that. But there were also like psychedelic bands. There were some of which go for four figures now. Who knows how much that Bent Wind album from Ontario is worth now, who knows? And stuff, it's a, like a homemade light psych Canadian record that I've never ever seen a real copy of it. But um, apparently it's very, very hard to come by because nobody knew about it and stuff. And who knows what happened to them all. There was another one I have like that called by a band called Rain, just R-A-Y-N-E, Four Brothers from Bayou Country in Louisiana. It's a heavy rock band band with really dark, scary lyrics and things. Then they pressed up the record and couldn't find anybody to do anything with it, let alone get any gigs. So they used almost all of them for skeet shooting practice. But luckily my old buddy, Paul Major found the band. That's what the collectors of that kind of stuff do. And sure enough, there were a few left in a closet and, and over a few, uh, something longer than this interview to negotiate, I got one in a trade. I think that's the one that has a song called Paint the Day Red, you know, going on a shooting spree and stuff like that. And that was before most of the shooting sprees even. But I think the one you want is a uh, Arkansas rocker by this band called Fighter. And uh, initially intriguing just because you have this band sitting on a bluff playing their guitars, aren't they? Yeah, they're kind of aiming them at these cops down below who have their rifles aimed at the band, thus establishing themselves as a badass Southern rock band, complete with one hell of a big ass drum set and everything. But this isn't just some lounge band covering Proud Mary or anything. This is all original material and having an having an ear for that kind of music because I grew up on it before punk and then I kind of purged myself of it in the early years of punk and then slowly but surely went back and yeah Black Sabbath is pretty good and so is this Captain Beyond album so is this Highway Robbery album another all-time classic although that was on RCA could have played stadiums you can't say that about too many of those bands Highway Robbery, you could. And another one that's coming up. Uh, can we see the fighter cover again? And have you seen cops pointing guns at guys with the guitars in any other record cover? Not on a record cover. Seen close with LAPD attacks on punk shows and things. But uh, nothing quite like that. No, no. The, and and I, it looks like they actually got the cops to do it for them because I think those are real cop cars and stuff. So uh, that's what you do when there's nothing else to do in their hometown of Moralton, Arkansas. That's where this is from is Moralton, Arkansas. Turns out it's 40, 50 miles outside of Little Rock. So they were in some suburb or whatever when this was what they came up with. Where did they play? Was there a little roadhouse circuit in Texas? I don't know. You and can another... actually check them out on YouTube. That record is on YouTube. But is this other Arkansas band on YouTube? Let alone if they ever played with Fighter, Meet Zorro and the Blue Footballs. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, they're from Fayetteville, where the big college is. You know, University of Arkansas, where their team is the Razorbacks. 
How about them hogs? So these people undoubtedly had to play for hog fans over and over and over again. It's kind of like sort of pseudo swingy, pseudo twentiesy music, although they do end with a funk song. So they kind of had to do all things to all people. Another one called Disco Madness which isn't even making fun of disco and some of their songs are supposed to be making fun of stuff and they they cover like a louis jordan song or something that was zorro and the blue footballs a good time band for your for your local bar but there are all kinds of other like heavy rock bands of varying reputations there was another one this one's from tennessee ambrose singing bust your nose Unfortunately, the music isn't quite as nose busting as you would like, but it's still yet another one. You find it once, you never see it again and stuff. Or the other people get a hold of them. You got to trade them or something else. <laughs> and then meet the Bandito family. Another Arkansas one, I do believe, Ozark Recording Studio anyway. So that points to the Ozarks Mountains to me the Bandito family, one of whom is quite young, and I'm not sure which one, I think it's one of the older ones, who in spite of it's supposed to be like kind of 70s rock and roll, and they know what they're doing, the lead guitar player really, really wants to be Dick Dale. That's good. The, yes, exactly. That and he's in the wrong band, but that makes this a really unique record. And Paul told me there's another one by them too. It kind of blew his mind because Paul Major got out of the weird record scene altogether and started putting out his own. I never even saw a guitar around his place, but he's a really good guitar player and does business as en Endless Boogie who do do endless spacey boogie, not Grateful Dead stuff, more cool psych and whatnot. But then you go running all kinds, here, here's Hector. This is Hector doing his song album, Deep Hair. And there is Hector's portrait on the back and stuff. I don't know how much, how much of this one is even good. It's in the box with the cool ones of these. Now this is one you need to, you need to look at, see if what you can get any information on this it's a canadian record echoes and a dream obviously very homemade and kind of dedicated with love to this girl i'm wondering if this uh rich kid or something inside who i guess is named keith porritt is the one who uh made this thing and um very late heartfelt labor of love kind of psychedelic -y throughout by the way and i think for some reason i associate it with calgary i don't think it's because somebody told me it was from calgary but you know you got the wizard on the cover and everything else but none of the people who collect this shit had ever heard of it before and know what it is what is it keith porritt echoes in a dream and there's the girl again on the front cover too and stuff. It's all for her and everything. Do you get a I chance to listen to listen I associate to everything? It with Cal I think I associate with Calgary because I'll bet you I got it at record land. That's what I was wondering about. Do you listen to everything that you have in your house? Like, have you heard all these records? Because I've been shopping records with you before and you like buy whole sections and probably don't have time to listen to the whole section that you buy. I am the Imelda Marcos of records or Citizen Kane or Michael Jackson on a shopping spree or something. I don't know. I'm not proud of that part, but I do. A lot of them I did listen to first and bought them because I want to listen to them more and want them in my library. I mean, I'm a librarian's kid. I'm very archive conscious and stuff. And so, um, you know, sometimes it'll just be on hunches too. Like I, I either put that Keith Port album, it's either terrible or it's one of those records that would blow a certain kind of collector's mind if they ever saw it. And it's more one of those and stuff. It ain't bent wind, but I'd love to know what the hell it actually is. And here we have the Sons of Mosiah. This is more of a homemade folky one and stuff. It's Mormons too, which is really, really odd when you think that at the time this was made, African-Americans still couldn't get into heaven in the Mormon church 
And Jello, what's on the back of that record? Well, as you can see, it's Mormons at a time when African Americans couldn't get into heaven, and the leader is a black guy. And even though it's more of a folky kind of churchy folky, but highly listenable for that kind of thing record, here they are on the back is an article from the Washington Post of all things saying rockers bring message to Mormons. Rockers. They ain't no rockers. And that post, maybe, Porter, maybe he should have known better, although this was early mid 60s when this was published. And I can't find it on the back, so the name is inside. It's credited to a Washington Post staff reporter whose last name is Mackay. Is that Ian and Alec Mackay's father? Yes, it is. I finally scored another one of these and sent it to Ian, and he was very happy that that turned up. He had no idea it existed and stuff until I told him. And I couldn't resist injecting one last one of these lounger bar band records because every once in a while, not only can you sometimes run into one that is actually genuinely not just good, but great, which was an Illinois trio called the Kaplan Brothers who made three albums that still have never been reissued. Actually, there's a fourth one too, an earlier one where they're covering old Israeli folk songs electrically. I've just seen it on YouTube. I'd love to get one of those if one ever turns up. Even Paul and my friends didn't even know it existed. Kaplan Brothers, the key there, it's very loungy. You can tell that's their audience and their circuit, but it's mostly sophisticated original material, kind of piano driven. And there's not just kind of good prog rock there, but there's a pronounced Ennio Morricone thing going on there at times too. You know, the guy famous for the spaghetti set Western soundtracks who just recently died. This is another one of those bar bet records by a guy who went on to better things. That's amazing. Is that his first recording? No, because he was Buddy Holly's bass player before that and stuff. And here he is back in Arizona at JD's, which was connected with a lot of Arizona garage rock stuff too. Live at JD's, Waylon Jennings. Waylon Jennings, that is amazing. Where'd you get that record? <laughs> Ironically, I got it in the same back room of unpriced records at Black and Red Records and Books in Arvada, Colorado, that the Fighter album turned up in as well. What a score. You know, it's, I, oh yeah, I mean, I can't score everything because then the guy's got to price them if they're going to go out the door. And some of them, I like, oh my God, I thought there was going to be way more. And then of course there's others, oh my God, I can't afford that in a million years. It gets to stay there and stuff. And yeah, this one was really high for me. It was 50 bucks, but I thought it was going to be 500 having never seen the record or heard of its existence before. So I was, I was very happy to have it. And there is rock and roll on here too. What happens if I show this to Shooter Jennings? The coolest one of those private press ones that actually really rock and they were after that audience and not just playing to people covering Proud Mary in bars. The, the, the one that blows them all away is this is from Liverpool in England. The band is Pinnacle and it's called Assassin. And there they are on the back too. This has been bootlegged and possibly legit reissued too by now, I don't know. But this one, it not only really rocks and it's well recorded and well made, it's more Sabbath than Deep Purple, although they have a keyboard player, but they're really, really good at it. Really good songs to the point where it's one of the few of those ultra rare sought after collectible audio dot records that I would say they could have played stadiums. Where'd you get that, that record? Good. Where'd you get that? Um, it, in a used record store in Liverpool that a friend took me to and they had a whole huge section of Liverpool rock music. And almost all of it was Mercy Beat originals and things, all kinds of originals by bands you never even knew made albums and stuff. Not necessarily the best Mercy Beat albums, but pretty cool to see that they actually did more stuff than I thought they did, see what they looked like, whatever. 
and um and that there was a second or third ian and the zodiacs album and stuff like that and then in the middle of all the liverpool beat rock bands was an original pinnacle record for 15 pounds immaculate copy to like, oh my god i can't believe this i never thought i'd see one of these so uh i took it home and you again are Jello Biafra speaking to me, Nardwar to Human Serviette, part three of our 2020 interview. This is our 14th interview, the first interview since 2013. But thank you for taking the time. Now, or the 16th, it's part ba -boom. three. Yeah, it is indeed. It is indeed. And Jello, thank you again for sending me some records when I was in the hospital. I just got out of the hospital. I got your email. I got a photo. What exactly did you send me to lighten my mood? Well, the ones you wanted to see again and everything. You know, and not like the gifts you sending me. I had just sent you pictures of records. You know, I'm being more stingy. My apologies. I'll figure something else out for that. But I know you want you wanted me to show this one. I got in a thrift store in Chicago. Aggie's telephone jams. It is on a Chicago polka music label, but it's basically a comedian. It's it's little you know recording spoken word vignettes, and you can't get this woman off the phone. And that's her whole thing. It's the woman you can't get off the phone. An amazing discovery. Thank you again for the picture of that record. Oh, yeah. Great art on the back, too. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you, you wanted punk for a minute. You're not going to get punk, but hey, anarchy, dude. The anarchic system, which is actually a slightly glammy radio pop band from France. But that was their name. What year? I would guess because of the glam overtones, uh, mid 70s with that one. I mean, you can tell by the hairdos too. You can tell by the by the do's and by the clothes and all that. I mean, that look got so run into the ground so bad that people began cutting their hair into spikes and putting safety pins in their clothes and stuff. And you have a Canadian holy grail, don't you? A Canadian Holy Grail. Oh, I have several. Which one do you mean? Which one are you well, thinking of this time? The mod. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. Now we're going into your demented 60s scene that was like no other. The Quebec people were the most bizarre of all in terms of fashion, but it's not far behind with the British, who aren't really British, mod beats. And they were, what were, were they from Toronto or something? I don't know. And of course, nobody in America knew, I, I doubt they even knew David Clayton Thomas, who was a huge star at one point, singer of Blood, Sweat and Tears. Number one was Canadian. And number two made really good records before he went into Blood, Sweat and Tears and made arguably not so good records, although he sure had a great voice from the get-go. We're talking about David Clayton Thomas and the Shays, of course. And then the next one where I, maybe they brought him to LA. I don't know, that incredible single called Brainwashed. You wanted to cover that, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I think you wanted me to do it with the evaporators. I finally, I think, got Al Jorgensen to listen to the song because sure, Guantanamo School of Medicine could do it or I thought about showing it to the Melvins when I was recording with them, but it really need that. That riff, the main one, is so deadly and heavier than almost any so-called 60s punk I've ever heard. It really, really needs to be a large song. It's got that the groove, room for Al's great big drums and great big guitars. I wish I could talk him into it. I don't know. He kind of has to think it's his idea or he doesn't do it. I mean, there's been more talk of another Lard album from him recently than there has been in I don't know how long. I mean, normally every three to four years, he announces another Lard album without us ever recording anything. Jello Biafra, let's hop over to Quebec, shall we? What do you have from Quebec? Well, as soon as I spotted them, I just kind of thought, that, well, you don't see this every day in the United States. These costume bands, these concept bands, like 
Le Classel being one. And at the time, or there had been some TV commercials, a long running bunch of TV commercials for Glad sandwich bags called The Man from Glad. Like the man from Uncle, the man from Glad. And he'd fly out of the sky in one of those little jet packs, bringing people plastic bags to save the day. And he had white hair like this. And I, when I saw these guys for the first time, I thought, oh my God, an entire band of the man from Glad's. And, you know, there's another one where it's not just the white hair, but they've got white guitars, white amplifiers, white drums, you know. You want to talk about a bell? Oh, yeah, that's white people. Well, yeah, they are white people and they are intentionally and a row of another one of their albums down by the drum riser, just in case you don't get the hint. And I don't know whether they came first and then other people like what happened after the mummies hit around here, thought they needed to start their own costume bands. Like there was the mummies, then Mike Lucas does the Phantom Surfers. And then Mike Lucas does a bunch of other ones like the Go Nuts. And of course the Knights of the New Crusade, which was an entire fake Christian rock band with medieval Life of Brian uniforms on and a sword and everything else. And Christians fell for them to the point where they got booked at real Christian rock festivals. And their lyrics were so like tongue in cheek, hard line, where it took a while to realize they weren't really a Christian band, let alone a Mike Lucas band, until the one called Dangers of Dating. Then I knew this had to be a gay. But anyway, yeah, well, what, back what to about the trash woman? Yeah, trash women. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Tina Lucchese was in that band too. She was a drummer and you got to admire her. She's just worked so tirelessly over the, over the years for those kind of bands, always playing her drums, singing in other bands like Top Ten or the Bobby Teens, playing drums in Trash Women and a bunch of other bands. I think she's actually the drummer in Midnight Snacks. And she has Down at Lil's, which started as her hair salon. And then they were mowing to selling cool used clothes and used records and stuff. Jello Biafra, more of the Canadian costume bands. Yeah, because this one that's called Spectacle or Spectacla or whatever. And what can be more spectacular when you're up against that kind of competition than just dress as Romans instead? Uh, Cesare Le Roma, there's some great video footage I think you sent of me on an old television show. And Cesar had quite the stage moves going on. They were kind of unique to him. Lift one knee, then lift the other knee and bounce back and forth kind of deal. They had some energy to them too. Bunch of stuff of theirs. But then, not to be outdone by Le Classel, of course, you're then going to get Le Eccentrique or however you, pre I'm sorry, pardon my French, it's probably wrong. Even if my real last name is Boucher, I'm generic American. Instead of the white hair, they had to have pink hair and pink clothes and pink guitars and everything. And what I'm told is that this entire album is French language covers of Beach Boys songs performed by pink people. And uh, there's all kinds of weird lost 60s things we never knew about down here. Like, oh, you're gonna introduce a guy named Terry Black. I call his album, The Black Plague. He's you know, from the, Vancouver, BC. The art on these things is just amazing to me too. Or another, another Canadian one, Le Michel. And uh, their rhythm et blues, but you know, just, you, you get these for the covers, and because nobody in America knows about this French Canadian scene that was only there, it wasn't even in France. Cello Biafra, when Bruno opened his bigger store, did you find any stuff there? Oh yeah, that was the one called Discavel, named in tribute to Escavel. He's getting all into Exotica now, and I may have even been the one who turned him on to Escavel. I don't remember, because we were talking about that for a while. And I started finding all these old, like that uh, Le Michel album came from there, and uh, maybe the red cover Le Classel came out of there too. But there was more and more and more of them, a lot of instrumental ones too. I guess you had tons of instrumental bands, many of whom played instrumentals with in French, basically. They had those kind of names, they had uh, French titles and stuff. And then there were other ones, like there was one 
called the, the Black Plague is enough, but then there's also, you know, you have your instrumental, and how are you calling it Elephant Rage? Or no, that's the name of the thing. Is It's the Echo Men. That's right. They do Elephant Rage. That's their own instrumental. They do Wipe Out and several other ones. And I finally, I think, realized because I found so many of these things one time when I was there, like, I'm never going to see this again. That was probably the collection in Bruno's basement he'd showed me years earlier when I marveled out of all these things I didn't know about, all the wild art and the the look and all that. I mean, that's probably where I found him too. Canada also fascinating for other things. I mean, Stompin' Tom Connors is completely unknown down here. And he, to me, just might be just about the best country singer of all time. You know, I know there wouldn't be no Stompin' Tom without Hank Williams or to, well, he credits Wilf Carter, a fellow Canadian country pioneer. But uh, amazing, amazing stuff there. And of course, we talked about these lounge bands that people sold stuff off the stage. I have one that I wanted to show. I couldn't find it when I looked for it. I mentioned it all. can't remember their name, but it's the only record I have from Yellowknife. And it's one of those kind of bands. The rural bands and the homemade stuff can be fascinating. Like here's, here's the Blue Boys. And notice not all of them are boys and not all of them are young, but it's the hometown band complete with bandstands playing all together. Really interesting bass that guy's got. I think he's in second from the uh, left or the right, depending on how you're looking at it. I think this is one of two I got at the same time from No Means No's later guitarist, Tom Holliston, who I originally met as somebody who really liked weird records. And so when I go and be in Victoria, he'd have something to hand me just to weird me out by what exactly it was and everything. He gave me a single about, found it pulled out of a thrift store of somebody singing about Stompin' Tom's foot the foot that would keep time that gave him his name. And he'd stomp on a piece of plywood, which he slowly stomped a hole through every night when he played. And uh, so later P his fans would mob him, wanting him to sign pieces of plywood and everything. So there was that one. I mean, people told me, oh yeah, he's this weird guy who likes really weird records. When he's tired of them, he leaves them at bus stops in Victoria. But Tom found another receptacle for that. And lo and behold, then he has the show business giants, I think with Scott Henderson, right? And then he's in no means no. I think I met him through Steve from the Neos originally, actually, not from No Means No. He was also the one who came up with another wonderful piece of Canadiana from the prairies, the Altamont Orchestra. Just enjoy the, the view of these fine people and stuff. And uh, it's a double album, too. There's all the titles on the back with a some random picture of some flat country road, could be Saskatchewan, could be Manitoba, Alberta, wherever. And then once again, double album, gatefold, they went to town on the, in, on the inside. Just went to town. Jello, for gigs in 2021, what do you think about gigs coming up in 2021? Well, um... I don't know if Guantanamo School of Medicine is going to play at all. I don't know if I'm going to perform at all. I am, I've kind of blocked out 2021 as something where I may not do anything. You know, I could stand to be in better physical shape than I am now for one thing. Plus, of course, there's COVID. And being the age I am and with some health issues now that I didn't have before, I don't want to risk catching that thing because I have to operate as though if I get COVID, I'm dead. That's how I have to be, which not only makes me think, you know, I am not going to go out and play for people and be in crowded rooms until the coast is really clear. And I think to all those dressing rooms, we all know so well in all those dives we've played over the years that may not have had anybody mop the floor in 50 years or if you're across the Atlantic in 250 years and you never know what's growing and living down there that you might take home with you. 
I haven't gotten sick very much on these tours, thankfully, but you know, you're always a little vulnerable when you're like gave it all, left it on the stage and, you know, half exhausted, you know, dripping wet and everything. You never know what can happen. And even as you're fighting off a cold or a flu, every last thing like that you're fighting off on tour is taxing your immune system that much more. And if COVID comes in, it may decide to stay. And there's already a new strain in England they're trying to control now. I just hope this isn't a permanent thing and we're stuck with no more live music. It's got to run around with masks on all the time. You and I may never see each other in person again. So I guess we have to do this a little more often or I'll never see you, old friend. And uh, I hope it doesn't come to that, but I am, I'm not going to risk doing anything dumb. Let's put it that way. Thus, people are saying, oh, yeah, they're booking the festivals in August again and all that. They're not booking me. I especially don't want to have to piss away all my own money because I'm the only one who would have any in the band to buy plane tickets for Europe and back for like seven people or more, to, including the crew, and then not be able to take the, get on the plane. You know, none of us can afford that either. So I'm hoping it'll come back, but... It, it's gonna, it, I don't know how it's gonna, how it's gonna work at first. I mean, at this point, because of COVID and the new lockdowns for good reason, and I've been pretty hardcore about that. Um, I don't see going out and playing until I'm at least comfortable going out and seeing somebody else play which is usually about the only time I'm in bars, but that's often when they're crowded, sometimes with way too many people, breathing and sneezing away as human beings do. I mean, these things can happen. I mean, there was a time in 1983, Dead Kennedys had to cancel a big tour. Other people did. Me and Klaus both got sicker than we've ever been in our lives. To this day, in my case, it was just some horrible, horrible thing, horrible throat pain. I stood up and blacked out and collapsed and missed my glass table by inches and stuff. That table is now in the living room. You know, that would have been horrible. It was called mycoplasma, as it turned out. And it was hitting all kinds of people besides the scene. But everybody who got it, we all traced it back to one MDC show at the Mabua. Thank you so much for taking the time to show your records, Jello. I really appreciate that. I really, really do. And spending all this time, people really have enjoyed. Well, what our, brings us? Go ahead. People I'm have sorry. enjoyed our interviews over the years. In fact, Good. I'm not sure if you remember Bob Cutler. He emailed oh, me. Oh, very he, well. He did sound for DOA in the mid 90s. And he said, the next time you interview Biafra, please make him answer each question in the style and form of his high school geometry teacher, Mr. <laughs> you uncork him. We're going to be here till part 11 or something. You know, the, yeah, I, I mean, we, we, we nicknamed him Quilly because he kept putting W's in front of words where they didn't belong. You've seen him at spoken word shows too. I left him out of the spoken word shows for the longest time. He was a geometry teacher who was instantly odd even before this stuff started. And, you know, he, 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 he had the same, same accent as the people in the Fargo movie and had Charlie Chaplin pants in the 70s and skinny black ties and a flannel hunting shirt over his white shirt. Or he had a suit jacket with kind of wings on it and stuff. And, uh, you know, a charming, endearing, endearingly odd guy from the get-go. And then things began to get weird. Now. We're talking about the angle C A B. Excuse me, B. Angle A D. Boy, am I having a time today? And it grew and it grew. And me and another friend in the earlier class period began writing these quotes down. He was normal probably 75 to 99% of the time. But when he wasn't, a great surrealist master was at work. 
And then he started tripping on words more. And like, you know, he'd, he'd draw some triangles. Now nah, we working with Knangagi troopers. No, 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 with a silver chalk holder in his hand. Congruent triangles, or congruent triangles, or congruent, or, 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 where was there? Excuse me, I. Oh, yes, triangles. No, tringlers. Oh, no, trianglers. Oh, I can't even try. <laughs> he didn't like it when he caught himself doing these things and stuff. And then after a while, there were Freudian slips about food, Freudian slips about sex, and Freudian slips, slips about Watergate, because it was going on at the time. But uh, uh, Mr. Quilly, do, do, uh, do fluorescent lights save energy? Well, it depends a lot on the boobs, or er, blubs, no, bulbs that you use. Or uh, now you can't, oh gee, can't lerva radicler in the derominator. <laughs> or uh, uh, so problems for tomorrow, take problems a wa, two, three, fork, bacon. <laughs> what were you supposed to do with that? I love your what? voices, Jello. I love like the Bill Barr voice on what would Jello do? You are amazing oh, yeah. with voices. I it went on, you said, like for the, 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 half an hour? Bill Barr one where I was reading stuff to show it around when he streamed it was, I read a paper he wrote for Catholic Lawyer Magazine where he talked about how society was going to hell and being so degenerate. People, there's even people spreading condoms and, and, and joining environmental groups. <laughs> you know, I, I, I hadn't planned that ahead of time, but what would Jello do? Little rant casts that have replaced the spoken word tours, because I couldn't do spoken word in Watanakumo School of Medicine at the same time. There just isn't enough time to like do it right and stuff. So um, instead you get the instant rants of what would Jello do? There's some more now, but that one, that one was about extreme Catholic fundamentalists because one got on the Supreme Court the very next week. Amy Coney Barrett, who may be the most extreme right-wing person on that whole court now, replacing the great progressive Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the biggest raised middle finger from Trump and Mitch McConnell of the entire trump -amuck or trump -zy, you know, T-R-U-M-P-Z-I era of all of them long-term. 6-3 majority fundamentalist religious extremists and Barrett and Barr connect way back because they're both extreme, not fundamentalist evangelicals or people picking up rattlesnakes or speaking in tongues. Oh yes, actually Amy Comedy Barrett does because she's in a cult that does the, the holy roller stuff only with Catholicism. Anyway, they are extreme even by extreme Catholic standards. And there's already other extreme Catholics on that court. The Chief Justice and Samuel Alito, that makes four of them, Brett Kavanaugh. And uh, there's it's a 6-3 Catholic majority too. Not all of them are the right-wing fundamentalist ones, but that's just, that's just kind of weird too. But uh, yeah, Barrett and Barr are horrifying. Jello Biafra. Any other records you want to show the people that are watching the Nardwar show? Well, just in case you didn't see the first two parts, we can always show the cover one more time right about now of the new Guantanamo School of Medicine album, Tea Party Revenge Porn, available online because the hard copies aren't finished yet but order them anyway and we'll get them to you or at least check it out online and uh it's uh, got all kinds of fun things on it we were talking about william barr there's a song on there called taliban usa for what they're about to do to women's reproductive rights and more but uh then a couple more in the like the homemade incredibly strange ones this is another one i've only ever seen once got it from paul major actually not a heavy psych record, no. It's Esther James doing, uh, what's the name of this? Yes, no man is above the law. I have kept the faith. And basically it's an entire concept album of her own Calypso songs on how much she hates Congressman Adam Clayton Powell. 
who was a huge, powerful congressman from Harlem in the 60s, considered a civil rights leader and everything. He was there forever. He was also a notorious crook to the point where at one point he served one of his terms hiding out in the Bahamas and stuff. So a mixed bag. Now he has a pretty good reputation. But here we have a... Uh, Adam Smart, Esther Smarter, and uh, an attempt on my life where she blames Adam Clayton Powell for trying to kill her and stuff. I can't remember why he was supposed to be after her, but she made a whole album about the whole thing. And now we've got these lunatics with their machine guns and their monster pickup trucks running around with their Trump flags in the back. He's got himself his own big neo-Nazi militia now. Trump is not going to go away, nor is Trumpism. And the last thing you want to want to run into is instead of the music we like, the American Gun Album. An what entire is that concept about? What do you think it's about? It's by gun fanatics for gun fanatics. Where'd my old man glasses go? What do we got here? Dedicated to the right to keep and bear arms. And it's like, uh, thank you, Smith and Wesson, God, guts and guns to serve and protect. America was born with a gun in her hands. We're rednecks and we're gonna keep our guns. Never mind the dog, beware of owner, gun toting woman. If guns are outlaws, only outlaws will have guns. This is all different songs. The survivalist, it's my alternative point of view. Yes, just uh, this is what they want, not just for America's future, but for Canada's future. Where did he get that record? I might have been a thrift store. I might have found it in a store. Thought, oh my, f I can't believe this exists. But I guess it's going to have to. And this, it's kind of like super cornball, like post Garth Brooks country rock country. If that makes any sense. Jello Biafra, why should people care about Jello Biafra and alternative tentacles and GSM? <laughs> Boy, that's the most hardball question you've ever asked me. Maybe since the first time you accosted me with a video camera. I don't know. Um, I'll answer it this way. Is that um, I think for the same reasons that brought us here today, you know, you like interviewing kooky people and musicians and showing weird records when I'm on because we kind of became friends over that, among other things. So I'm just grateful after... Uh, 40 plus years of doing that. It's even the, over the 40th anniversary of the label was last year too. Ban Alternative Tentacles still surviving in spite of Dead Kennedys being yanked away by ungrateful ex-band members and sold down the river in unspeakable ways, including an upcoming remix version of Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables. But my God, who do they think is gonna buy this and stuff? People didn't know even flock in millions of numbers to buy the remixed Let It Be or the re-remixed Let It Be album, the Beatles album. So, and of course I was completely cut out of the whole thing by those guys. It took four lawyer letters, the only way we communicate now, their choice for them to even fess up. This is gonna be part of a double album with the original album and this awful remix. And then there's gonna be a video with it and there's gonna be a booklet with it. and. I'm allowed no say. I wasn't even told it was happening. So all I can say is some people may like it, but buyer beware. And for crying out loud, if you're thinking of getting it for the remix, listen before you buy. Well, thank you very much. Oh, look at that. Look at that product placement. The label where the legit Dead Kennedys albums were. Alternative tentacles. The logo that's launched 10 zillion t-shirts. And you can even get the coffee cups right now. We're making them again. A lot quicker than you can get the vinyl on Tea Party Revenge porn. Yeah. Well, I didn't even thank know you, you had one of those. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Jello Biafra, keep on rocking in a free world. And keep on trying to preserve it as a free world, too. Wait till you get your own Trump. Harper was just the beginning. Keep on washing your hands in a free world. Good advice. Do, 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 do,
All right. Yeah. yeah. I can see your head. Now I'm pouring stuff on you. There you go. All right. You froze again. Was that intentional this time? I guess I, can you hear me?